Dr. Dunnick, thank you for taking this time to meet with me. The purpose of this interview is to discuss your life and legacy here at the University of Michigan and the way you view how things have gone over the last 25 years. Thank you for your time. It's a pleasure to be here. The University of Michigan Health System, now known as Michigan Medicine, means many things to many people. It's routinely ranked in the top 10 in a variety of medical subspecialties and training programs, and patients come here from hundreds or thousands of miles away to seek care in these walls. And after spending 25 years or more here as the chairman, I'm curious, what does this place mean to you? I was raised about 150 miles from here in northern Indiana. I went to college at Purdue, and the best of our uh, graduates seemed to want to go to the University of Michigan. It was common for them to come here to get graduate degrees and particularly get MBAs. And so it always had a very positive reputation for me. So when I began to think about becoming a department chair, the University of Michigan was very high on my list as a place I'd like to go. It has a reputation of, of excellence, uh, but also of integrity and it's been a leader in diversity. It's the university that took it to the Supreme Court and lost, but at least tried. You've overseen the installation of PAX workstations, the elimination of hard copy film and alternators, the introduction of electronic dictation systems, the obsolescence of transcriptionists, innovations in all forms of medical imaging, SPECT, CT, PET, MR, ultrasounds, and the explosion of medical imaging, both in volume and effectiveness. Of the many changes you've observed over your career in our specialty, which of them strike you as having the most impact? Well, really, it's the computer, because that's what's made all of this possible. Uh, Cormac received the um, Nobel Prize for demonstrating that a CT scanner could be built. Uh, he did it mathematically, but never produced any images. Uh, it was Hansfield, of course, that produced the first images, and it took literally days to reconstruct those images because of the power of the computer at the time. Now, of course, we can do sub-second scanning, so, and, and it's the computer that's, that's really uh, driven it all. I think we've uh, been able to do things much faster than we have in the past. Uh, we've become more efficient as a result of it, um, but on the other hand, we've lost a little bit of the human element as well. Do you have a mantra or a slogan that you live by? Well, uh, that's a very complicated question because life is complicated. But uh, Gerald Ford said something uh, uh, like, work hard, uh, be honest, and come home for dinner on time. And I think that last phrase uh, uh, reminds us about the personal side of our lives. Uh, we so often talk about a balance between professional and personal lives. And coming home on time uh, means respecting that personal side. Is there a living or historical figure who has had a significant influence on your mannerisms and priorities? Well, we're all... Uh, a function of our biographies, of whom we've interacted with all our lives. And I've had a series of mentors, and I've learned from each one of them. Of course, we didn't call them mentors in, in those days. Uh, they were just more senior people who gave me help and advice. Uh, historically, uh, as a uh, lifelong baseball fan, uh, I've also uh, learned lessons in leadership from them. And one of them is uh, Joe McCarthy who was a manager of the Chicago Cubs. And the story here is that Hack Wilson uh, was an outstanding baseball player, became a Hall of Famer, uh, started out with the New York Giants, and John McGraw, another legendary manager, uh, played what we call small ball. Uh, that is before Ruth really introduced the home run. And uh, Hack Wilson was not a great small ball player but he was very talented. McGraw kept him tied into his system, which didn't fit Wilson very well. Wilson also had a problem with alcohol, and McGraw was a teetotaler. So you can imagine, the two didn't fit too well. 
So he traded him to the Cubs, where Joe McCarthy was a manager, and Joe recognized both M Wilson's talent, but also had the ability to manage him. So we worked with him on his uh, drinking problem, kept that under control, and Hack Wilson went on to set the National League record for most home runs in a season and still owns the record for most RBIs in a season. Hmm. Well, Joe was fired by the Wrigleys because although he won the pennant in 1929, he didn't win the World Series. So at the end of the 30 season, he was fired, he went to the Yankees, and became a legendary manager for the New York Yankees. When he left, Hack Wilson deteriorated and was out of baseball in just a couple of years. So it's, it's managing people. That's really what leadership is all about. Understanding them, uh, trying to work with them to get the best out of them and minimize their deficiencies. Many radiologists recognize that you had a role to play in converting the old oral boards format into the now multiple choice format. And that change understandably created a lot of reactions from people, both positive and negative. In retrospect, was that the right decision? And if so, why? Humans resist change. It's normal. Uh, but you have to work through that. And uh, there was a problem with the oral board exams that we didn't really want to go too public with. And that was the inconsistency of the exam. Uh, we had examiners that I called zealots, that liked everybody, didn't fail anyone. And we had people at the other end of the spectrum. And so the exam that someone got uh, varied with who they got as an examiner. In GU, we had people who did MR, people who didn't, people who did ultrasound, people who didn't. And so the exam given by those examiners varied by the examiner you drew. So you had a variation in the exam, you had a variation in the scores, and then you would occasionally even have glitches, shall we say. Uh, we had an examiner who answered a cell phone during an exam. Uh, just things that just absolutely cannot be done. So we really needed to move off that format. We needed to do something that was more objective, more consistent, and of course, a computer-based exam is a good way to go f to do that. Mm -hmm. So what is your biggest regret? I try not to think about the many mistakes and things that I wish I could have done over because that's past. I think of the Rubiat of Omar Khayyam, the moving finger writes, and having writ moves on. <laughs> nor all your piety nor wit can lure it back to cancel half a line, nor all your tears wash out a word of it. So I try to think forward rather than backward. Understood. In future generations, trainees and faculty who are not yet here are going to walk into our radiology library and see all the paintings hanging on the wall, and one of them will be yours, and they'll wonder who you were and what you stood for. What would you want them to know about you and the department in which they now work? Well, I think of these positions uh, like a relay race. Uh, it was my turn to carry the baton, and I need to run as hard as I can before I pass the baton on to the next person. I'd like people to think of me as someone who gave their full measure, running as hard as they could before passing it on. As you move into a new phase of your life, the department is nervously awaiting who might be your successor. Your tenure at the University of Michigan has been incredibly successful and stable, of course. Change always brings trepidation. If you were in charge of the selection committee choosing the new chair, what characteristics would you prioritize? Well, I would say there, there are two things. Um, whoever the new chair might be, I would hope that they would be a good listener. The people doing the work know more about what they're doing than the chair can. And so they really need to be constantly gathering information, learning uh, about the department and what people do. So 
they shouldn't think that they know more than others or know all the answers. They should be um, working with the faculty to try to have a, a departmental response to, uh, to gather as much information as possible. The other um, answer I might give you is I've spent some time thinking about chairs who fail. And I think there are several categories of those. Uh, but one category that I would try to watch out for are people who want it for personal advancement rather than people who are trying to improve the department, the institution, to advance the field, uh, to make radiology better and to make that department better. Uh, I often say, it's not about me, it's about the department. And it's what the department can do can, to contribute to the medical center and ultimately improve patient care, because that's why we're all here. We have definitely seen examples recently and in the past of chairs who go with the best intentions to places, but for a variety of reasons, it doesn't work out. And oftentimes that leads to bad blood, hurt feelings, turmoil. If you could offer advice to the incoming chair to help prevent that from happening here, what would it be? First, to come in and learn as much as you can about the institution. Try to understand the culture of the institution. Talk to all the people, understand why they're here, what their goals are, what they're trying to accomplish. Um, because I think one important part of the chair's job is to, to mentor, to help, uh, so that all of the faculty can try to achieve their goals as well. The trick, of course, is to make sure that their goals are consistent with the, what the department needs to have done. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you about the future. In 1997, Deep Blue destroyed chess grandmaster Gary Kasparov. And in 2004, Ken Jennings won 74 consecutive episodes of Jeopardy won $2.5 million outsmarting the smartest people who'd ever been on Jeopardy before being demolished by a computer, Watson. And in Final Jeopardy, he famously wrote on his answer, I, for one, welcome our new computer overlords. In 2016, AlphaGo, which is a Google product, bested master Lee Sedol 4 to 1 in the game Go. And after the match, Lee stated, it made me question human creativity. When I saw AlphaGo's moves, I wondered whether the Go moves I have known were the right ones. In 2017, you can open your phone and type the word tree into the picture folder and it will automatically find for you every photo you've ever taken that contains a tree. Facebook can recognize billions of faces regardless of what position or orientation they're in or the lighting. And Elon Musk, creator of Tesla and SpaceX, has described artificial intelligence as an existential threat. So I wonder, in the context of radiology and rapidly accelerating artificial intelligence technology, outpacing human performance in complex tasks, how should radiologists and radiology departments position themselves to thrive in this new age, which seems inevitable? We can't stop progress, so we should welcome it. Artificial intelligence, uh, we have many different terms for it. I think of it as machine learning. Uh, is something that I think we can harness, that we can use, we can make our lives better. If you think of all the technology advances, um, they're coming. The real question is, how do we use it? Can we use this to help us with the more mundane parts of our job so that we can be a better interface with that imaging information and care of the patient? I think there's a, still an enormous role for the human. Uh, the question, how can our computers, how can machine learning, artificial intelligence, if you will, help us to do a better job? It could be scary. You know, if you're looking down the future and you see computers coming for our jobs, what would you say to medical students who are considering radiology as a field but are nervous that a computer could completely replace their function? Well, I, I would prefer to use the word exciting rather than scary. Uh, I think the potential here uh, is incredible. What I would like to see <clears throat> is including the patient uh, clinical information into the exam protocol. 
Very difficult for humans to do all of that. But if we can get the computer to help us with that, couldn't we do a better job? Then when it comes to the interpretation, we, that clinical information, as well as all the other knowledge that we've accumulated over the years, comes up with a pretest probability. We add the pretest probability to the imaging findings, I think we'll be much more accurate in our final interpretations. Sounds like you're optimistic. Very. Burnouts become an increasingly important topic in 2017. As you know, you speak about it often. Our clinical volumes continue to increase. Reimbursement declines. Research dollars are becoming harder to find. And this has led to many stressing the importance of work-life balance, or as others have put it, work-life alignments. Can you please speak about how you balanced or aligned these issues when you were a junior faculty? And what advice would you give on this topic to current or future generations of radiologists confronting the same thing? Well, I'd go back and expand on that a little. Uh, we spend more waking hours working than any other single activity. So it's important for us to enjoy what we do. So I often ask people, why do you get out of bed in the morning? Well, sure, you got to pay the rent, but why do you want to come to work? What, what are you thinking about when you drive in? Are you thinking, I'm going to see some great cases, I'm going to make some diagnoses, I'm going to help patients get better faster? Do you think, I've got some research projects going and I can't wait to see where the next dot's going to go? Do I think, you know, teaching trainees, medical students, residents, or fellows, and seeing their eyes light up when they learn a new concept. Does that really turn you on? Is that where you get joy? Uh, so asking them why they do what they do. Why do they enjoy it? Why do they get pleasure out of that? I think that's what job satisfaction is all about. Compensation is one component of job satisfaction because we do have to pay the rent, but it's really what we do on a day-to-day -day basis uh, that brings us joy. And as long as we're, we're enjoying what we're doing, really not worried about the other aspects. I think the problem we've gotten ourselves into is we're used to working uh, at this level and we're used to getting this compensation. And as you said, that equation is changing. So those people who are very concerned about the compensation side, well, maybe they need to find a different job, one that emphasizes that. But if you think about um, enjoying what you're doing on a daily basis, uh, I think we're all still going to be able to send our children to college. <laughs> and when you compare radiology compensation with other disciplines, we're still much better off than many of them. Was there a particular moment in your career trajectory, perhaps a specific mentor or a specific patient, maybe an external event in your personal life or externally, uh, that you feel had a major influence on your eventual trajectory? And if you did have such an event, did you recognize it when it was happening? Well, the last part is probably the easiest, no. Mm -hmm. But uh, we are, we're a product of, of our biographies. And I, I can think back in so many events that uh, helped shape who I am, what I did, where I went, how things worked out. Um, I can remember being an intern and caring for a patient with congenital heart disease. He was an adult by that time. Uh, and he painted a picture for me. After he dis was discharged, he went home, he created this painting, and he brought it to me in the hospital. And I was touched by, uh, by the effect I must have had on him and realized the, uh, the tremendous importance of the uh, profession of medicine and our effects on people. And it made me be even more concerned about how I interacted with others, uh, and especially our patients. Um, I can remember working with Ron Castellino at Stanford and uh, his uh, emphasis on efficiency, and that was a big help. I remember Henry Kaplan, and Henry uh, talked with me and he he spoke about the importance of the department rather than the individual. And uh, 
I still remember, he said, Reed, when I go to the hospital and tell them something, I don't say, Henry Kaplan thinks this. I say, the entire Department of Radiology thinks this. It's more powerful. Uh, I think of John Dopman, always analytical and always thinking and always coming up with new ideas. And I was at the NIH. I used to walk with John when he had a meeting in some other part of the hospital because he'd just keep talking and keeping up, coming up with ideas. And it was, he was just a remarkable individual that, uh, that I learned so much from. When junior and mid-level faculty meet with you for their annual review, which I've done on occasion, uh, you're notorious for asking them, where do you see yourself in five or ten years? And I'm curious, why do you ask that question? What advantages does it give you, and what advantages does it give the faculty to understand the answer to that question? Well, um, I'd like to know what makes people tick, what makes them happy, what, what gives them joy. Uh, because I think if they enjoy what they're doing, they'll do a better job. So if I can understand what they like, uh, I often ask them, why do they come to work in the morning? Uh, to try to get that same type of information. If I can understand where they want to go, what their ambition is, if I can help them do that in a way that also helps the department, we'll have a win-win. So I try to understand uh, each of the faculty and try to work with them to accomplish mutual goals. People look at your career and they look at it as a career of tremendous success. And I wonder if you always knew what you were going to be doing in five or ten years. Uh, no. Uh, I can tell you that I uh, always enjoyed work and as uh, People talked with me about new opportunities. I always welcomed new challenges. Uh, I think that's part of enjoying work rather than doing the same old thing over and over again. Uh, so for me, uh, new opportunities, new challenges uh, were some of the things that kept me stimulated, kept me excited, kept me interested, made me enjoy work. For the person who doesn't have an immediate answer to the question of where do you see yourself in five or ten years, do you think that's a problem that they should put a lot of attention into, or is that something that comes naturally, organically? I think they, they should think about it. And of course, that's one of the reasons to ask the question, is to get people to think about what it is that they enjoy and to seek out positions uh, that will help them with that. Uh, not everyone enjoys the difficult conversation. And if that's the case, probably shouldn't be in a leadership position. Uh, other people enjoy uh, gathering information, uh, giving advice, being helpful, being an essential part of the team, but don't really want to be the person um, that has to make the difficult decision. The, uh, you can't please all of the faculty. And trying to do that is a sure way to fail. So you have to make difficult decisions realizing that some people are going to be unhappy with it. But you've got to think, did I make this for the right reason? So now I'm sitting on the other side of the table asking all the questions. So I'm going to ask you, where do you see yourself in five or ten years? Well, first of all, I hope my health holds out. I'm doing my best to try to live a healthy life uh, because uh, uh, health determines what happens to all of us. And we've, we've seen that in uh, people we've lost at a far too young age. Uh, but assuming that's okay, I'm looking for more challenges. And uh, serving as editor of Academic Radiology is a fascinating challenge. I'm already very excited about it. And, uh, trying to make it better, uh, trying to make it more efficient, trying to make it uh, more user-friendly for the authors, for the reviewers, and uh, make it more readable for the uh, people who look at the journal. So that, that's a fun part. Um, I'm not quite sure what role I'll play in the department. Um, the, the job of chair has become too busy. So I will uh, suggest very gently to the new chair that they might want to 
uh, delegate more to others. And maybe I could play a role in that. Um, uh, there are many, uh, many things that require work, require some degree of expertise, but aren't terribly um, innovative, shall we say. Uh, faculty promotions would be one good example. They take a lot of time. They take more time than they used to. Um, and yet we, we decide we want to promote someone. Um, there's a lot of work to convince the medical school uh, that they should agree with that decision. Uh, so, so things like that, I might be able to be helpful to the new chair so that the new chair can spend more of their time worrying about the direction the department needs to take. Mm -hmm. To sustain a successful career over a long period of time, no doubt requires continual renewal of the sources of motivation that got you started in the first place. How would you describe what motivated you in the beginning of your career and have those motivations evolved over time? Well, I think the simple answer is, how can you make a difference? You know, we sometimes talk about uh, uh, how was the world a better place because you were here? And if you ask yourself that question, uh, sometimes I, I've said in faculty meetings, when your grandchildren say, Matt, what was your job? And you'll tell them that you interpreted radiographic images and their eyes glaze over and they lose interest. Um, they might say, but what did you do? How did you help people? And medicine is a great profession because basically that's what we try to do. Um, so how did you make a difference? Um, that's one of the ways I, I think about it. And then the second way is how did I help other people make a difference? Or how did I help them find their way in life? There have been actually quite a few faculty who were unhappy. And I said, go into private practice. And they did. And within a year, they called and said, can I come back? Uh, realizing that they belonged in private or in academics, but hadn't quite realized that, and forcing them to take a job in private practice so they could experience both sides of their career options, um, I think helped them realize that they really belonged in academics. And, and I think I helped them along their careers in doing that, even though it might have been considered a little tough and a little cruel uh, to tell them I had to leave. Medicine sometimes gets a bad reputation. Long hours, coupled with intrusive information technology systems, a Byzantine payment system, seemingly unending bureaucratic oversight, and it continues to stymie the happiness of the people who work in this profession. In fact, many doctors tell their children or think to themselves, gee, I hope they don't go into medicine. What advice would you give those who are considering a career in medicine in general today, or radiology specifically? You have to do what you enjoy. And when you think about the professions, Medicine is still one of the best. Our goal is to help people. Law is an adversarial profession. It's the lawyer argues for his or her side. They don't seek truth. It's adversarial. Business, it seems to me that they honor those who made the most money. Uh, I think helping people is a much more honorable a uh, way to live our lives, and I think the far better profession. I think some of the frustrations that we deal with are things that we, we really need to work on to improve, because you're absolutely right. Uh, the electronic systems we're using, particularly the electronic health record, is far uh, from helpful. It's a problem right now and needs to be improved. So on balance, if one of your young family members were to come to you and say, do you think I should go into medicine? What would you tell them? Great choice. Many may not know this, but you were an avid baseball fan. Uh, at your 25-year celebration, people actually gave out baseball cards with your picture on it and your stats. You've been a longtime supporter of the Chicago Cubs. And I find they're an interesting franchise because they've been able to sustain a relatively stable fan base, you included despite failing to win a World Series for over 100 years. 
Then in 2016, they broke through and won it all. What lessons can we take away, radiologists working in a department, as an organization about loyalty and perseverance despite adversity? Well, until last year, I used to say one of the nice things about being a Cub fan was that it teaches you humility. But I think the reason <clears throat> for their uh, longtime fan base uh, has many uh, origins. But first, uh, going to Wrigley Field is a positive experience. The park is relatively small compared with many of the new ones. It's unique. It has ivy on the walls. It's a very nice place to be. So it's a positive, pleasant experience for people. Secondly, it's located pretty close to downtown Chicago. So you can take a bus, a subway, you can drive. It's relatively easy to get to. You don't have to go way out in the suburbs uh, to find the stadium. So I think the combination of ease of access, um, pleasant experience, um, makes people uh, a good fans of the Cubs. Hmm. So about those Cubs. So 14 years ago, the Cubs were in the National League Championship Series facing off against the Florida Marlins. Chicago was ahead three games to two, as I'm sure you remember, and they were holding a 3-0 lead in the eighth inning. And the writing was on the wall. They were finally, after all these years and so many generations, going to make it back to the World Series. And then disaster struck. The team melted down. They lost the game, 8-3, to and they went on to lose the series. Now, I'm sure there were a lot of events that contributed to that loss, but the fans had one person that they blamed, someone in the stands, a guy named Steve Bartman, for interfering with a fly ball. Apparently the ball was coming close, the guy rode up to catch it, and the fan may have touched the ball before it actually should have been touched. And for years, that person, Steve Bartman, un endured unending criticism from many people, so much so that he had to go into hiding, he had to leave his community. It was awful. How did you react as a fan to that whole thing? I'm curious. And how do we as an organization learn from that experience about the perils of playing the blame game when something bad goes wrong? As I looked at that, it, it was unfortunate. Things might have turned out differently. But if the team were really great, they wouldn't have been in that position where a single event would have affected the outcome of the series. So I think our job is to be as good as we can be and hopefully have a margin for error. Uh, we see that in many of our quality efforts. Uh, you're quite familiar with the Swiss cheese analogy. So if we um, have our system as robust as possible, we can pick up those errors so that we won't suffer uh, the, interfer the fan interference in left field. You're also an admirer of Bo Schembechler, former Michigan head coach of the football team. He had a series of famous quotes that people like to say around here. Those who stay will be champions. Or, I want a Michigan man for the job. And the team, the team, the team. What do those famous quotes tell you about the importance of emphasizing the organization over the individual? Well, I completely agree with them. And my favorite, of course, is the team, the team, the team. Uh, life is a team sport. Uh, everything we do is a team. Uh, the radiologist may interpret the final image, but it was the technologist who actually did the study. It's the company that built the scanner. It's the nurse who injected the contrast. Uh, it's the clerk who scheduled the patient, referring physician who referred them, the patient who chose Michigan to come to. Uh, we've got to get the entire system working well together. Uh, it's not about one person. It's about the team. Faculty uh, like to compare themselves to other organizations and to their peers. And Michigan is a famously frugal institution. And at national meetings, Michigan faculty are often reminded that they could make more money if they just were to go somewhere else. And yet, despite these entreaties, they often stay. And our attrition rate has historically been very low. 
And I suspect that the loyalty of the Michigan faculty would be surprising to someone from another institution who might wonder, why would you do that when you could do this? What do you think it is that makes Michigan faculty so loyal to the department when it's true they might make more money going somewhere else? Well, I'd answer that in two ways. First is there is a culture at Michigan uh, that's very positive. And I notice that even in my niece, who was raised in Southern California, came to the University of Michigan as an undergraduate, actually wanted to stay for law school, uh, but wound up going to the University of Wisconsin for law school. But she still has season tickets to the football uh, games and comes back at least once a year, and I'm happy to stay, saves with us. <laughs> it's great. And I asked her, why is it? Why is there such team spirit? How, the spirit among the students, about everybody here on campus. Her response was, it's not fake. It's real. And people are proud to be part of it. They're proud to be Michigan alumni. I can tell you when I travel, even overseas, if I'm wearing a Michigan hat, a Michigan sweatshirt, uh, everywhere in the world, people will say, go blue. I can remember meeting people in the Red Fort in Jaipur, India, standing in line, waiting for a, a bed and breakfast in Scotland. Uh, the people next to us were proud to tell us about uh, the year they spent in Ann Arbor doing a postdoc at the University of Michigan. There's great pride in the institution. The second part of my answer would be, uh, it's not about one thing, it's about job satisfaction. Working is the thing we do more than any other single activity in our waking hours. We need to like it, to enjoy it. So job satisfaction is coming to work, doing what you enjoy doing, working with people with whom you enjoy working, and doing it for a common good, trying to help people. I think money is part of job satisfaction, but it's a relatively smaller part. When I talk with potential faculty about uh, what they do in life, what their joys are. If they tell me that they really like boating, they want to have a second a vacation home, they want to own a boat and go boating in Lake Michigan, I say, you know, private practice might be good for you. <laughs> but for people who are intellectually curious, we give them the opportunity to exercise that curiosity. And that's what I think makes a great faculty. Do you think the culture of the department plays a role in the fact that people like to stick around? I do. I think we, we try to explain to people what we are, what we're about, what our culture is. And if they uh, gravitate toward that, they're going to be happy here. And so trying to be as transparent as possible when we interview candidates uh, I think really helps uh, the culture of the department and helps people be happier in it. In 2017, uh, you gave a lecture at the Society of Abdominal Radiology on leadership. And from my memory, it was one of the best attended uh, talks at that meeting. And everywhere I looked, there were people of every age, of every end of the spectrum, taking notes. And no one was on their phone, which is surprising in this day and age. Uh, one of the key things you mentioned that stuck with me, and I think you mentioned it several times, is that culture trumps strategy. Can you expound on that, and why do you think that's so? Strategy is something that we um, come up with. We come up with a plan. How are we going to do something? We create a strategic plan. <clears throat> but if that's not consistent with the culture of the organization, it's not going to work. And one example that I think everybody can relate to are the speed limits on our freeways. The strategic plan is that the speed limit is 70. But if you drive 70 miles an hour on I-94, you're going to be rear-ended. The culture says the speed limit's more like 80. And so we drive 75. So culture trumps the strategy of those who thought 70 miles an hour ought to be the speed limit. We see the same thing in our daily lives. Uh, our culture says we're trying to take care of patients. Um, 
Our strategy is that faculty work until 5, and then one person is the late person until 6. But the culture, if you walk into the abdominal reading room at 5.30, you'll find a lot more people than the one late person. That's our culture. Mm -hmm. I think culture can be an invisible thing, an intangible thing, hard to put your finger on. Uh, and maybe somewhat hard to define. Well, what is really culture? I think it's simple to say culture is important, uh, but maybe harder to purposely develop it. What advice would you have for leaders who are interested in shaping or cultivating or changing the culture in the place they work? Yeah, that's a very important question. And uh, my answer is what, what is culture? And how do we migrate or move culture in the direction we think is, is better for the institution. Uh, it's, it's everything we do. It's what we put on the walls. We put plaques on our walls uh, to remind us that we give an award for the best research done by a resident. We put plaques on the walls to remind us that we bring in visiting professors who give us new ideas and talk about uh, how they're doing at other institutions, things we can learn from. We put pictures of our trainees on the walls because we think they're important. We're proud of them. We want to do the best job we can in preparing them for their next jobs, whatever they are. We begin our faculty meetings with kudos. We congratulate faculty for the doing the things that we want them to do. We keep uh, moving our culture. We stay on point. We focus, and very importantly, we walk the talk. We've got to do what we want others to do. We want them to see us doing the right thing and want to do it as well. Do you think that culture mismatches between incoming chairs and existing cultures of departments are major reasons why chairs do or don't succeed? Yes. They, uh, the first thing that I tell new chairs is to learn the culture of that institution. Try to make no decisions until you've done that. It's hard to do. There's some decisions you just have to make. But they really need to understand the institution in which they're working. Is that institution a research institution? Is that institution trying to prepare the physicians to practice in their area? Many times state institutions, that's their primary job. Uh, at Michigan, we are a research institution. Certainly, we produce practitioners for the state of Michigan, but we don't think of ourselves as a primary job as producing those practitioners. Uh, we want to advance the field of medicine through research. And so research is very important to us. And a new chair who doesn't recognize that is not likely to do well. You've been the president of virtually every society that's relevant to you. Society of Euroradiology, Society of Computed Body Tomography and Magnetic Resonance, American Rankin Ray Society, Michigan Radiological Society, American Board of Radiology, Association of University Radiologists, Society of Academic Radiology Departments, Radiological Society of North America, Radiology Research Alliance, Academy for Radiology Research. I probably missed a few. I'm not <laughs> sure. Uh, what draws you to positions of leadership? Well, any organization you join, you should try to help that organization accomplish its mission and maybe do it even better. So I think participating in these organizations and working with that goal in mind uh, is a good thing. And a position of leadership enables you to leverage those efforts to help move that organization faster, more efficiently, better, so on and so forth. It also gives you the opportunity to help our own faculty uh, participate as well. And it helps, it makes it a little more likely that they will be appointed to committees, maybe have leadership positions in those committees, and be able to exercise their own ideas in how to improve that organization. Mm -hmm. Was it always a personal goal of yours to make your way into these positions of leadership in various radiology societies? Or did that happen 
naturally just through your own participation and active engagement? Was it a plan or did it happen organically? No, I must admit I never really thought about it. But when people came to me and said, how would you like to do this? I almost always said yes. So I think they may have looked at me as somebody who's likely to uh, accept a responsibility and try to just start to discharge it as best I could. I think the concept of saying yes is often uh, spoken to younger radiologists or younger academic people when they say, what should I say yes to and what should I say no to? It sounds like you said yes a lot. What advice would you have for people who are just getting started about what to say yes to and what to say no to? Should they ever say no? Should they always say yes? Well, I guess it depends on how often they're asked, but uh, I think what you have to think about is where am I trying to go? And if, if we can make that decision, and it's often a difficult one, then the decisions we're asked to make now are much easier because we have a kind of a roadmap telling us where we're trying to go. Uh, I also tell people not to burn any bridges they don't have to, and unfortunately, if if you decline an offer, the person making that offer thinks you're not interested. They don't usually think, well, he's probably really busy right now and can't do it today, but maybe tomorrow he could do it. They think that you're not interested. So I would tend to err on the side of saying yes too often. And then if you find yourself really uh, overwhelmed with things to do, maybe at that time would be a good time to start saying no. Understood. When mentoring uh, younger physicians, they will frequently say they have no ability to affect change in their environment because they have no title after their name. What advice can you give about what makes an effective leader, especially for those who may be struggling to lead but don't have that title? Yes, I think titles are, are often a misconception. Uh, one doesn't really get power from a title. One gets power by what they do. Uh, if a faculty sees another faculty uh, behaving appropriately, doing good work, that is as powerful as having a title. In fact, I think it's more powerful than the title per se. I think it's more what we do than a title we might be given. When you are engaged in something that's challenging and you have to exert change, how much of that leverage is through diplomacy and how much of that leverage is through knowing that you're the chairman? Leadership is getting things done through people. You can demand that someone does something, but if they don't believe in it, if they don't really agree that it needs to be done, they'll do it half-heartedly. They won't do a good job of it it's more likely to fail. You really have to get people to understand what is you want done, why you want it done, and how it will uh, help everyone, how it will be better for the organization. Once they buy into that and agree that this needs to be done, then they will do a great job. They will do a better job than if you told them what to do. How often do you involve the stakeholders in the decision-making process versus how often is the decision more autocratic? Well, of course, it depends on the nature of the decision. The uh, capital equipment is a good example. For many years, it was a simple depreciation process. The equipment was fully depreciated. We got a new one. It was pretty straightforward, so we didn't need to have a lot of discussions. Now. We have a much different capital equipment process. Uh, full, full depreciation is just the first step. And then, is it still functioning? Is there technology advantage? And so, um, a more nuanced decision is required. So here we may need information from more people, people who are actually using that equipment. And then, unfortunately, it often gets down to, yes, we have half a dozen things that we really need to do but we're only going to be allowed to do three of them. So how do we choose which three of these six things uh, that we're actually going to accomplish this year? So it really takes much more of a group decision than it had in the past. It's often said that the leader of an organization or a state doesn't ever see easy decisions because if the decision is easy, someone else, one of their subordinates has already taken care of it. 
So the only problems that they get are the complex ones. So I suspect you see many complex problems. What is your strategy for negotiating situations in which you have multiple parties involved, each with their own viewpoints and preferences and goals, and there's no easily visible middle ground between those two or three or four different parties? That's one of the most difficult uh, challenges, actually. Uh, the, as you say, the easy ones, you don't even think about. <clears throat> they just happen. Uh, the more difficult ones, you, you have to start weighing uh, the consequences of this choice versus that choice. And here I find it helpful to remind myself of our priorities. Would this decision benefit our patients? Would it benefit the university, the medical school, the department, the faculty? And I personally always have to be on the bottom of that list. If I ever find myself moving up, it's time to step down. So thinking about the effects of a decision and uh, prioritizing who's important. And the patient's the most important. So we have to always keep that utmost in mind. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a story about a difficult leadership challenge that's not too politically sensitive uh, <laughs> that you've encountered and how you navigated it? When I came, uh, the department was giving uh, clinical supplement B bonuses. And many of the faculty, uh, well, the way it was set up at that time was um, people who were off the schedule for research uh, didn't get credit for that research time. And uh, I felt that that sent a message that research wasn't important. And yet research is important to our institution and therefore must be important to our department. So I did make the change. I said, we are giving a full share of this bonus to all faculty who are full members of our department, regardless of whether or not they're funded on external grants. They're still contributing to the department, even though they're not specifically contributing to the clinical service at that time. It may not have been a terribly positive a decision among many faculty because the vast majority have no funded time. But I think it was the right thing to do and we went ahead and did it. For those in the vocal majority who were complaining this was not the right decision, how did you navigate that? You just said this is what you have to do, we're doing it, deal with it? Or was there some niceness to it? Or how did you handle that situation? It's always better to have friends than enemies. It's sometimes said that friends come and go, but enemies accumulate. So try to avoid that whenever possible. Uh, but there are times you just have to say, this is what we're going to do. Uh, you try to explain it so that people understand the basis for your decision. Hopefully they would agree, even though they may be personally disadvantaged by that situation, hopefully they will understand that it's better for the group as a whole. Sometimes that doesn't work out too well either. <clears> then <throat> I might get down to saying, um, I'm disappointed that you disagree, but if you decide to leave the department, rest assured I'll write you a very nice letter. <laughs> I think when a, a decision is popular and right, it's easy. In those situations where the decision may have a right or moral choice that's the clear answer, but the majority of the people oppose it, do you have a general strategy for handling those situations where there's something that's morally correct mm -hmm. to do, but the faculty, for whatever reason, are in the majority opposed to that decision? It's a tough question to answer because um, you're making the statement that the decision is morally correct and yet the majority is against it. I have great respect for group wisdom, with the caveat that they're up to speed on the issue. So if we can get the faculty to engage in a discussion so that they really understand uh, what the decision is all about, and if we can come to a consensus, I'm happy to go along with a department's faculty consensus on the issue. Uh, 
I think I would be a little bit arrogant to say that I am correct on this challenging decision and the rest of you are wrong. So it sounds like when the majority is opposed to a position you may have, it would make you think, hmm, maybe they have a, a point of view that I haven't discovered yet, or maybe they don't have the information that I have. One of those two things. Exactly right. So we try to bring them up to speed and say, now what do you think? <clears throat> this was a good example at the American Board of Radiology. We joked that we had to vote on things three times before we acted. And the point was this. We would bring up the issue, we would discuss it, we'd make a decision, but happily we'd drag our feet before doing anything because it was only at that time that many of the board members would really start thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And then they would come back and say, oh, about that issue, um, let's talk about it again. So we would. And sometimes it even took a third discussion to really arrive at a mature decision that we should act on. How many votes did it take to get rid of the oral boards? <laughs> Very few, actually. There, there were many discussions that went on. I mean, we loved the oral boards. The, it was a great time, the, the camaraderie, to meet your friends coming from all over the country, uh, to engage in a process that we firmly believed, and I still do, helps improve the quality of health care, the quality of radiology practiced in the country. People studied for those board exams. It was a rite of passage. Uh, I'm sure they learned things. One of the problems, however, is that they were often learning, they were memorizing things that it was not durable learning. They would memorize things that they could retain for a few weeks, but not for the rest of their lives. So it wasn't as good as many people thought, but it was a very positive experience for the examiners. In fact, we'd go to that, we'd spend a week in Louisville at a two-star hotel. Uh, food was not easy to find, usually took a long cab ride. It's not noted for its great cuisine. It was right next to the airport. You'd hear the planes landing at all times of day and night. Uh, and at the end of the week, you'd be a little tired and you'd say, gee whiz, was this really worth it? You'd go home. You'd kind of forget uh, the negative parts and remember the camaraderie and the mission and you look forward to the, to the next year. Uh, it was difficult to end that. And yet I think when people thought about uh, the negative aspects of that exam, they knew we need to make the change. Uh, you're famous for starting on time and ending on time. Uh, if you show up five minutes late, you're probably already talking. Why is timeliness mm -hmm. so important to you? Well, if you call a meeting, you want people to come on time. If you don't start on time, you're telling them your time is not as important. I think everybody's time is important. It's important for us to respect one another, to arrive on time, not to expect that the meeting will wait until they come. I think it's a matter of respect. And I notice that for our division directors meetings, they're pretty good about coming on time. I think people appreciate it. And lastly, is there anything else you'd like to share that we haven't covered? Well, there are many more things we could talk about. <clears throat> but I think job satisfaction, knowing yourself, understanding what you enjoy, what you like doing, because I think that's where you'll do your best work, working with people. When I think back, when have I been the happiest? It's been when I've worked with a, a group of people that really enjoyed working with each other and tried to help each other. I can remember being a vascular radiologist at Duke and been between cases. I'd run back to my office, which was only about 40 feet away, and sign a couple papers, do a couple little things. And sometimes I'd realize, gee whiz, 20 or 30 minutes went by and I'd rush back into the angio suites and somebody else had 
helped out. They were helping me do that job. And I think when, when everybody's trying to help each other, the work disappears, the work is fun, it's, life is good. So try to find uh, teams of people who can work well together and do a great job. I want to thank you for your time. This has been very interesting. Thank you for your dedication to the department. It's been my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you, Matt.